Good evening and good day to each and every one of you that are tuning in at this time to be a part of this moment. In time, because of who God is and because of what he is doing. I welcome you all. Um, wherever you are, wherever you are from, I am grateful to God for this privilege and this opportunity that has been afforded to us to be able to continue to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And uh, as we hear, we are better able to, um, as I've been using this, this word or this term for lack of a better word, able to navigate the times. You think of what Jesus said in John chapter 10. He says, my sheep hears my voice and um, a stranger they will not follow because they do not know the voice of a stranger. So we understand that in order for a sheep to be properly cared for, it is, it is, um, it, it, it rests on the sheep's ability to hear the voice of the shepherd. For the sheep to be led into green pastures, into led to where the water is still, because it is, it is a known thing that sheep will never drink from where the water is troubled or noisy. They, they flee from it. So it has to be still, quiet. In order for them to experience that, in order for them to be protected, they must hear the voice of the shepherd. And that's why Jesus used that, to liken to us as the people of God. And so, you know, saying what I'm saying about hearing the voice of the Spirit, it is important for us to be um, in the place where God wants us to be, where he has already ordained and established for us to be, and for us to be sustained in that place, is having the ability to hear the voice of our Father, the voice of God. So, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this privilege and this opportunity that we have been given to come together around the word and to unlock, unpack, uh, decipher the mystery, the things concerning the kingdom of God, why your kingdom exists, the purpose of it, what it is in support of, who it is in support of it, where the earth is concerned. Because, Father, your kingdom extended, it extends from heaven to earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. Father, I pray that your people will understand more of what your kingdom is and understand the purpose of it and what it is meant to accomplish in and through our lives and for our lives. Because as Jesus said that we should not worry about what we eat, what we drink, or what we will wear, what we shall put on. He says, after all these things, the nations, the heathen, the pagans, those who don't know God, these are the things that preoccupies their mind. These are the things that they're going after. But he says, as for you, Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. So Father, we, 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 we should understand from that statement that Jesus made that everything that we are meant to be and experience and how we're meant to live life and how life would be sustained, it is within the kingdom of God. As we understand that he is, is a authority and power that is in place, that is established and is in place, the constitution of his authority and power, it is within the context of a kingdom. So Father, we cannot take the, the message of the kingdom, the understanding of the kingdom, the things that the scripture reveals to us about your kingdom from Old to New Testament. Your kingdom has been talked about. The prophets prophesied about even the coming of the kingdom in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So may we not... May we not ignore it or step aside because of whatever 
uh, uh, the, the, the reasons may be that the, oh, the enemy is working, but may we be able to discern and understand how he is working and that he is working from a kingdom to oppose the kingdom of God. And there is something about your kingdom, why he doesn't want us to hear it, why he doesn't want us to understand it, why he doesn't want us to enter it. Because as the scripture tells us that the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers that they should not see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ the gospel of the kingdom so father i thank you for ears that are being open to hear as we ought eyes open to see as we ought and for us to experience that which you intend for us to experience in this moment as the word comes forth thank you father for hearing and thank you for granting it as the spirit rests upon us in wisdom and in revelation in the name of your son jesus the christ we ask we believe and we receive Amen. I want to continue to talk about understanding the times. I think this would be um, about what? The 10th installment where that teaching is concerned. I started from the 1st of January. It was a Saturday, which was our fast in time, fast in gathering, fast in meeting. So I want to continue it. And uh, I want to... Um, remind you of what the scriptures say in regards to what we are looking at and using to build our layer foundation where all of this is concerned. I know that there are other things that I will eventually bring to add to this and for us to understand more of what's really going on in the world around us, how we ought to view. That's very important. And one of the reasons why it's important for us to be getting these information from the Word, there is so many information that is out there, left, right, and center. Every social media platform that you can think of, there is information. I mean, if it's Twitter, WhatsApp, um, Facebook, YouTube, name it. The internet is a gateway of information and i mean there is good information and there is bad information now what what the word of god helps us to do and the spirit of god and these kinds of teaching that is coming forward to us now what it helps us to do is to be able to 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 separate what is good from that which is not we read in the scripture where it tells us that we should prove all things, test all things, hold fast to what is good. What gives someone the ability to test something? What, what allows, uh, in the natural world around us, they have um, inspectors that, um, that goes around to inspect buildings. You have inspectors that are there to inspect um when 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 they when electricity when the electrical wires are run in through the house or a building they put up the 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 box for the breaker box and stuff like that after the electric the electrician does all of those wiring before they before they they um they get to the point of it being used or consumed by whoever is going to occupy that building. They have the inspector come in and inspect. What, what caused a person who inspect that? What gives them the ability to do so? There is a standard. There is a standard. They have standard in place for how electrical wires are run, the color they have color code name it so the inspector would be someone who have been educated in that with that knowledge with that understanding and know the standard that canada has those in the united states they know the standard that the united states have and any other country so that when they come and they look at how the wiring is put in place and they look at the wiring for the box with the breaker box and stuff like that if it is not done according to the standard they're not going to pass it and if it is not passed they, they can't they cannot 
they cannot complete that building or that home or whatever for anybody to use it. So they have to make sure that it is done according to code. And so when the inspector come and look at it and say, no, this is not so and so, then they have to correct it. So I'm saying all of that to say this, that when it comes to God, many of us who say we're of God, we act as if God has no standard. And it's not that we're not operating from any standard, because if we reject the standard of God, you know what we're doing? We become our own standard. That's what we see in the scripture with Israel. Scripture tells us, in the book of Judges, I think about four times the statement is made. In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So when we reject a standard, it doesn't mean that we remain neutral. We come up with our own. We see that in Romans chapter 10. It says the children of Israel, they had a zeal for God, but it was without knowledge. And it says as a result of that, they went about and established their own righteousness their own righteousness. The church must wake up and understand the times that we're in. And we should repent and align ourselves with God, with his standard, and accomplish that which he sent Christ in the earth to die for, to pay the price for, for us to be redeemed and to be restored to him and come into the fullness of that which he originally intended when he created the heavens and the earth and created man at the center of it. So as I'm talking about understanding the times, it's based upon what is presently even happening around us. And I'm not talking about this for the purpose or for the sake of the world. The world will never hear this and much less to receive it and to even be a part of it. They are already using their own standard to determine what is going on around them. So they're talking about global warming. They're talking about certain, you know, things that are happening as a result of this and as a result of this. So they're now working to fix to fix what they believe is the problem that is causing certain things that is happening. So we have, um, over the past few years now, we have the, the, the G7 and the G20, the gathering of the 20 nations, the gathering of the 10 or, 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 or 7 nations. G, G is for gathering. So G20 is the gathering of the 20 and so on. And when these, these nations come together, it's the prime ministers and presidents and like Germany, we have the chancellor. They're coming together and they, 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 they know that this is what people have been crying about, talking about, and is concerned about. So they're now discussing the global warming issue and other global issue, and they're now putting things in place because people, of course, is expecting our leaders to do something about what is going on. But at the end of the day, can they do anything about what is really going on? Can they? Really. Stop and think about this. So now they are they're planning. There are plans that um, Canada agreed to, France agreed to, the United States agreed to, um, England, name it. All of these different nations that by 20 so and so, they're going to cut greenhouse gases. They're going to cut emissions. They're going to cut this and do it. And that's why what we see happening right now with the electric, the, the, the emergence of the electric vehicle, um, Tesla is leading the charge where all of that is concerned. We see other car makers are now jumping into this market because they, they see that people are gravitating towards these things because with the electric vehicle, you don't have any emission and all of these things. So what the governments are doing, they are giving incentives to people who buy an electric vehicle. So because of what they're now trying to do to fix, they say, what is going on where global warming is concerned, all of these things are happening. That's why we see these things happening. But I'm asking you the question, and I'm asking us who are believers in Christ, will they fix it? Can they fix it? You have to ask these questions because where the end of the age is concerned and the things that Jesus said would happen on the earth, what they are calling global warming, what does the scripture call it? 
Because it's not, it's not randomly happening. It's not by accident or coincidence so that they can just go and fix it. Because how long they have been talking about global warming? And every year they said it gets worse. Every year. I, you notice in the pandemic, because the lockdown, the first lockdown, and people were at home, some working from home, some was laid off for the time being, temporary, laid off and so on. We see this great movement across the world where people were protesting against where global warming is concerned. And we see all the stuff that was happening with racism and all of these stuff. Because people were at home having more free time in their hand, you would say. What they did, and I'm not saying people shouldn't march and we shouldn't protest and, and stuff like that, but should the church be a part of these things? Because what we're doing, will it solve the problem? Hmm? Why are these things really going on at the end of the day? And this is what I want us to be aware of as we look at the scriptures. Signs of the times. Even, listen. Racism has been around for a long time now. And what we see a bit that has been going on in the last few years is there's an intensity. And I keep hearing governments, prime ministers and so on saying, oh, this is 2020 or 2019 or 2018. It's modern time. This is not supposed to. And it's what, what we see happening is that it's getting worse. Even when they arrest some person, they send some to prison and they do what, it's not going to solve the problem. Why? Jesus said that would be one of the signs. Nations against nation. The Greek word is ethnos against ethnos. What we call race against race. He said that would be one of the signs. So what we see in Canada, in England, in the United States, we see an intensity irrespective of what they're doing. Irrespective of the law that they have passed against xenophobia and dysphobia and all the phobias. It is not stopping and it will never stop. So we as the church, we can't look at it the way the world looks at it. Look at it from Jesus' standpoint because it's all about him. He is the one that has the final say in all of this. The signs of the time. Yes, racism, the intensity of it and the way we see it's going, Jesus said it would be one of the signs. He said, you will see nation against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. And he said, when you see all these things begin to happen, he said, it's not even the end yet. It's not the end yet. They said, the end is not yet. What would determine the end? He tells us, he said, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a witness to every nation, to every ethnos, and then shall the end come. Watch this. The preaching of the gospel of the kingdom is what gives hope to everything that we see going on around us in the world. The hope in the midst of it all is the gospel of the kingdom being preached. It allows the human who is willing to hear it to understand that the world that we see around us is under the influence of another kingdom. Another kingdom. And in order for me to be free from that entrapment is to be a part of the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is the greater kingdom. The kingdom of Satan is actually in play to oppose the kingdom of God. But it cannot stop the kingdom of God. And so everything that is being shaken as the scripture says... And if you don't see the pandemic as a part of that prophetic scripture that God says he's going to shake the earth once more and shake the heaven also, if you don't see it as a part of that shaking, then what is it? Look at what it's doing. Every sector, every industry, there is nothing, there is absolutely nothing on the earth presently right now that is not touched by the pandemic in some way or the other. Family, name it. Every corner you turn. And so God says that he's going to shake. And what is the purpose? He tells us the purpose of the shaking 
is so that everything that can be shaken will be shaken and it's being removed. Watch this. So that that which cannot be shaken will come forth. What is it that cannot be shaken? The scripture doesn't leave us in the dark. It says we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That cannot be shaken. <laughs> so as we talk about understanding the times, we have been looking at math, um, uh, the foundation, um, some of the foundational scriptures like Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 21. Isaiah chapter 46 and verse nine and verses 9 and 10. Isaiah chapter 48, 48, verses 3, 4, and 5. And what those verses is showing us about God, it's, it's showing something about how God thinks, how God functions, how God operates. It's revealing the mind of God to us, the people of God. Because whatever was said in the Old Testament, it was not said to any other nation but the nation of Israel, which was God's covenant people. If it was even said to other nations, they wouldn't be able to receive it and understand it, much less to come into the experience of it. But Israel was the one that God said that to, for them to understand why he chose them, why he called them unto himself, and that they were his witness among the nations, as the church also is meant to be today. In the Old Testament, Israel, God said this about Israel, you are a special people unto me. I called you out of Egypt, chose you, called you unto myself, I brought you out on eagle's wings, he said that you may be a special people unto me and a kingdom of priests. In the New Testament, God says to the church, you are a chosen generation, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a special people call out of darkness into my marvelous light to show off my praise. To who? To the nations. So even in these times, the church ought to be that city that is set on a hill. The church is supposed to be the light, radiating, radiating who God is through Christ, giving hope to those who are looking for it. That's how the church is supposed to be functioning in the earth. So we're not, we, we cannot function like that and, 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 and caught up in the way the world thinks and view things and operate. If we are, then we're not the light. We're not that city that is set up on a hill. If we're going to be that city that is set on a hill, we have to be completely, perfectly governed by the word and by the spirit of God. Yes. So as we look at those scriptures, we see this, what, what God said to Israel. The gods that you have been trying to compare to me. He says, stop it. You will never find any God that can be compared to me. He said, there is none like me. And he, 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 he revealed he, he reveal one of his ability that he put out there that no God God, no God can ever match up to that. He says, I declare a thing from the beginning. I declare the end of a thing from the very beginning. So therefore, everything that is being worked out from this point on is to support what I have declared from the beginning. So, we look at... Um, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And in First Chronicles chapter 12, what is happening in the backdrop of it is David is the newly installed king over the nation of Israel and he's God's choice. David is God's choice. The scripture said that he was a man after God's own heart. He was a man after God's own choosing. That's what it means. So when God chose him to be king, first for seven years, David was anointed first as king over Judah because he's from that tribe. And then later on, after seven years, he was anointed over king over the entire 
entire nation of Israel, and he reigned for 40 years. During this time of David being installed as king, God, the scripture tells us in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, endued, he gave the tribe, the sons of Issachar, the ability to understand the times, which was God, which was God's operation towards Israel. How God's economy would manifest in time to support Israel. The sons of Issachar was able to determine, was able to distinguish, understand the times. So watch this, so that Israel would know what they ought to do. We come into Matthew chapter 16 and we see Jesus speaking as the Pharisees and the Sadducees approach him. And they request of him to give them a sign. Show us a sign from heaven. Jesus said, When it's evening, morning and evening, you're able to look at the sky and tell what you know the weather is going to be like. And he says, You hypocrites, you can discern the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said that. You can discern the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the time. There, there are signs of the time. God doesn't leave his people blind. <laughs> God doesn't leave his people guessing. God doesn't leave his people feeling and if and butting and wondering what's going on here. Could it be this? Could it be that? No. He put provision in place for us to accurately, with authority and power, navigate everything that is going on around us with peace and rest. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. Do you think that Jesus didn't know when he said that, that he was also talking about the end of the age, that for whoever, whoever believes in him and is still alive on the earth, that peace would continue to be a part of their journey in time. So we're not supposed to be overwhelmed. We're not supposed to be confused. We're not supposed to be living with uncertainty. We're not supposed to be in fear. We're supposed to be in rest and peace. How is that going to be true for us? By understanding the truth of God's word and being able to hear and see what the spirit is saying and doing. And being led by such. Now, after looking at Matthew chapter 16 in the New Testament, I looked at um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Um, I think it was one of the fasting meetings past where Paul said to the church in Thessalonica, he said, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write unto you about it. You don't have any need for me to write to you about the times and the seasons. <laughs> Why? For you know perfectly that the day of the Lord, imagine Paul is talking to them about that from way up there. How much more now? He said, you know that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. But until that manifestation takes place, there are signs that are meant to point to that happening. And as the sign shows up, we understand that there are certain manifestations that the signs is allowing us to be aware of, for us to anticipate. And as we anticipate it, we're not anticipating it in fear again, as I said, or in, an, in, 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 in uncertainty and all the things that we see going on. We're anticipating it happening based on the promises, based on what God says in his word and what he has promised to us as his people in it. Because Paul said this. He said, you know perfectly that these days will, this will happen. And then he said, but those, those who are outside, for them, they say 
it's peace and safety. Sudden, sudden destruction will come upon them. He said, but, but for you, for us who are in Christ, he said, you are not of the dark. You are children of the light. You are children of the day. That, that day should not overtake you as a thief in the night. So they, Paul said, you know, and the reason why Paul was able to write to them and say that to them is that he knew that he had taught them well. And whoever else they came in contact with as an, as an apostle or in, 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 in what we see mentioned in Ephesians chapter 5, they were not like many of the so-called preachers today who compromised the word of God. They did not. They teach the word of God for what it is so that the people of God are properly prepared for what will show up because it's not if it's going to happen, it will come. But how will we face it? How will we deal with it when it shows up? It's not if it's going to come because, because listen to me, if I, if I had told the world uh, before that this would have happened, do you think that they would have believed me? No, they wouldn't. Because they're busy loving pleasure more than God. Right? And they're all about comfort and convenience. So anything that is going to interrupt that, they are against it. But for us as the people of God, we know that when God speaks, because whatever God has said... What he has declared from the, from the very beginning, the end that he declared, everything that is playing out in human history, the events of human history, is a part of the end coming to pass. Huh? So when we look at that, we see what Paul said to them. And then we looked at um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, which I read on Sunday. Now I want to go to 2 Timothy. I want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is the last scripture that specifically talks about the times. And as I said, each of the scripture that I have looked at, you look at the context of the things that is said as it, as it reveals to us the end of the age. As in, as in um, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says, Paul said to Timothy, the spirit, now the spirit spoke expressly saying, plainly, clearly saying that in the latter times, many will, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils. That has come to pass. And so many other things. And if we believe the prophecy, the prophecies of scripture, and look at all of those that have already been fulfilled even where Christ is concerned, and some of them is there twofold. So a part of it is already fulfilled, and the second part is yet to be fulfilled in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we believe that any part of prophecy has been fulfilled, and even in our time we have seen certain things come to pass, why would we not believe the rest? Because whatever has happened before, whatever came to pass before, that is meant to, to, to cause our faith to be concreted, if you may, in who God is, in the faithfulness of God, that the integrity of God. And it gives us, it gives us a place where we're capable of standing in sure and secure and know that it cannot be shaken. So watch this. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul writing the second letter, he spoke to Timothy in the first letter about the end of the age. And then he continued in the second letter, that, which, which is showing us, I can take you through the entire Bible. And I promise you, the majority of the books, the, the Old Testament, the majority of the books has something to say about the end of the age. And we are sleeping. And as I said, many of those compromising preachers, they are not saying anything about the pandemic in reference to the word of God. They're still preaching the prosperity message. 
They're still, still preaching the new age philosophy that they were preaching before because to them, oh, this is just something that just accidentally took place and so it soon pass and, and, and we're going to go back to normal. And I hear some preachers for this year, 2022, they're saying that, you know, this is the year of... Um, this is the year of, uh, of prosperity. You know, they said 2021 was, was a rough year, but, but church, you know, the, I, I saw the Lord in the end of 2021 and the Lord said to tell you that this is the year of prosperity. This is the year that we're going to prosper. This is the year that all the things that didn't happen for us in 2022. Like, like listen, there is never a year that anything that God wants done for his people not happening. What, what, this, what the preachers feel to understand that the things going on around us does not stop God from being God to his people. Look at Israel. The more they persecute Israel is the more they increase. So for the preachers that are telling you that 2021 was a rough year and this is the opera, God was prospering his people in 2021. In 2020, God was taking care of his people and he will take care. So I'm not going to come here and tell you that God tell me that 2022 is going to be a better year for you. Whether the year rough or not, God take care of his people. And it does, it is not based on the things around you going smoothly. God prosper. If you look at scripture carefully, it's in the time when things out there is rough and famine and whatever, God show off himself stronger towards his people. Isaac, famine showed up. And he's planning, he's thinking in his mind, I'm going to go down to Egypt. God appeared to him and God said, no, do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land where the famine is. And God reminded him of certain things that he said to him about his father Abraham. And God says, so in the land. In the famine? So, yes, so in the land. And the Bible said, in that very year, what the seed that Isaac sowed, it brought forth a hundredfold where the Philistines envied him. And told him to leave from among them. You think God is waiting for normalcy to come back to in order for us to have any peace? In order for us to be in the whatever he wants us to be or for us to be cared for? Does God depend on the IMF? You think God borrowed money from IMF to run his kingdom? <laughs> huh? You think God, you think God depend on America functioning a certain way in order for him to take care of his kingdom? No. So don't listen. Any preacher that is telling you that God told them that 2022 is going to be this for you and for they don't know God. Because even before the pandemic showed up, what was going on in the world around us? Violence, killing, crime, corruption, drugged, human trafficking, name it. Rape, pedophiles, name it. It's all in the church. What we call church, it coming up. But God continues to be God, bringing to pass the things that he has declared from the beginning. And as a matter of fact, the things that are coming forth where evil is concerned, it's a part of showing off who the devil really is at the end of the day. The things that God has revealed to us about Satan, there are people that doesn't believe that that is so. And God is allowing it to be seen clearly and for us to understand who the wicked one is and what he looks like and how he operates and why He's operating the way that he's operating against a human. So Paul, as I said, writing to Timothy, and every one of the letters that Paul writes, the church in Corinth, he talks about the end time, talks about the return of Christ. In Galatians, in Philippians, Colossians, and then the personal letters that they write to Timothy and Titus, he remind them of what God says concerning the end of the age. 
And here he wrote, as I said in the first letter, and you thought that that would be enough when he said that the Spirit spoke expressly. In the second letter, and if you look at the, 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 um, the history of this, you will see the timing in which the letters were written. And so in the second letter, Paul is writing, and it's, it was in the second letter, he wrote to Timothy, telling Timothy what was going to be the end of his journey here, how his journey here in time would end. Remember, it was in the second letter that he said to him, the hour of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. He said, I am ready. He says, I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. But he says, you know what? I'm not afraid. I have kept the faith. I've run my race. Finish it. And I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. So here he's writing and knowing that this is his final letter. After seeing Timothy, because Timothy was with him on many of the journeys, as we read in, in the book of Acts, Timothy traveled with him on many of the journeys that he went on. So he had that time and fellowship, and Timothy was his mentee. Paul mentored him. I, think, I believe that Timothy got born again under Paul's teaching, preaching, and so Paul took him, as I believe God would have that to be so also, and Timothy himself became an apostle. We see Timothy being a part of some of the letters that were written, as Paul made mention. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, and, and so on and so forth. So Timothy was uh, one of those, um, what you would say, unique son in the faith. And so he knew that his time, the time of his body expiring was close. The Spirit showed it to him. And so he wrote this final letter to him. And he said this in chapter 3. As he, st he started talking to him from chapter 1. And he also reminded Timothy that God didn't give him the spirit of timidity, the spirit of fear. But he gave him the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. So he said, do not allow fear to dictate to you, Timothy. And he said, remember that gift that is given to you. Stir it up and continue to function the way that God has purposed for you to function. And then he gets to chapter 3 and he's he reminded Timothy of some things and showed him how he should view the world around him. I have come to understand this, that for many of us who say we are of God, we fail and dare, I would even dare say, refuse to see the world around us the way that God sees it. And I'm here to tell you this, that the world around us is not what any government said. The world around us is not what America says. Because what, what does America say about the world? How does America view the world? Right? The world is not what any nation or any government, any prime minister or whoever say. The world is what God says it is. And when you fail to believe God, you continue to see the manifestation of it. Because the governments cannot fix it. You notice how the world keeps changing governments? Election. I, I'm surprised that we would have election even now. Do you know how many elections went on in, in 2020? An election that is now going to take place in 2021? In a pandemic, where they're telling people about social distancing and stay home and do all of this stuff, you would think that, okay, they would wait until it's some kind of normalcy come according to them for us to have an election. But in the midst of the pandemic, people are looking for a change of government. Do you know how many government ministers resign, step aside, because of things that the pandemic has exposed and brought and put them? Many of them, they were caught on camera, pictures were taken. Taken, videos were taken that while the, the, the emergency um, act was in place that you're not supposed to gather, you're supposed to be wearing masks, pictures reveal ministers in groups, in gathering. Right now, the prime minister in England is in trouble because they have pictures of him in a party. At a party, he's making excuse about it. And the opposition parties are demanding that he resign. So listen to me carefully here. We must see the world if we, if, I, mean, I, I keep emphasizing that for a long time. If we are born again, if we are of God, because the present church today is filled with jokers, filled with wannabes, filled with mockers, filled with pretenders, hypocrites. And the hypocrites are being exposed even now. 
the pretenders. Jeremiah says, when God begin to judge, he said, what will the hypocrite in Zion do? When the judgment of God come forth, what will the hypocrite in Zion do? What are the hypocrites in the church doing right now? They are, many of them, they are terrified. They're in fear because they never know God in the first place. And there is nothing to sustain them. But the people who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Let me take the few more minutes that I have here with you for this moment and show you this final scripture that is speaking directly concerning the times. I'm not saying that other parts of the Bible is not, but as I said, I, 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 based on how the Holy Spirit guided me, I am showing you the specific scriptures that are speaking about the times and what it is saying about the times and how we should also be seeing the times around us. Hear this now in 2 Timothy, the second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. It says this, But know this, the Apostle Paul, writing by the Spirit to Timothy, as I said, and to us also. That's why we have the book. That's why we have the letter. But know this. But know. Notice, you're supposed to know. But know this, that in the last days, watch this, perilous times will come. You notice it said times, perilous, dangerous times will come. How many believe God? And that there are those of us, even preachers who boast that they have been you know, I've been walking with the Lord now for 40, 50, 60 years or so. How many of them believe this? That they continue from that very time? Because prior to you being saved, you would not have looked at the world in that way. But after you're born again and you're being properly fed, you're being properly taught the word without any compromising, you would have heard this, you would have seen this. From that moment, you have to readjust your mindset and view the world the way God says that it is. Hmm? Paul says, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. That's why I have been saying this for years. I am never surprised when I hear about the crimes, the violence, the killings, the abuse, and the things, human trafficking, government have been doing all they've been doing for years to try to stop this. They cannot stop it and they know it too. But they're not telling you. You know, because they, you, you put them in power and you're expecting them to fix everything. But they cannot. And they make all these big promises while they're running and doing their campaign. And then they come in. And for the first 100 days of, of coming in office, they try to you know, do certain things to fulfill some of the promises that they make. And then after the first 100 days, they realize, you know what? I can't do this. And so we start to you now criticize them and we, their ratings start to drop. And by the time the next four years come around, you know, we, 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 we say, you know what? We, we, we need to change the government because this one, look, they come to the end of this term and they didn't fulfill this promise that they made. They can't do it. They can't. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm not running for office, so I'm going to talk the way I'm talking. If you're, if you're walking with God, this is how you're going to speak, right? I'm not going to go around con and compromise and twist and, and tell you something to, to impress you or to manipulate you, intimidate you. No, no, no. I'm not going to give you any gimmickry. That doesn't help. So he says, perilous times will come. Again, Paul wrote this to Timothy nearly 2,000 years ago. So let me read it based on the present, based on the current affairs. But know this, that perilous times has come. It is here. We're living in it. And notice the things that he said to Timothy that you are supposed to now look at to determine the perilous times being upon us. He says, for, what, 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 are, what are the manifestations of the perilous time? For men will be lovers of themselves. Are we seeing that? 
If you're not seeing that, you're blind. Hear this. Secondly, they will be lovers of money. Look at the world. Look at the world. <laughs> and a part of the shaking that God is doing is judging the systems of the world. The educational system is being judged because it's not of God. It's against God. If you notice the educational system that is in the world around us, it focuses on you and it doesn't teach you anything about God. The focus is on you. You getting an education to do what? To get a skill? To do what? To get a job? To do what? To make money? To do what? To get a house? To get this? To get that? And then later on, you retire and you have something to support you while you retire and live out the rest of your retirement fulfilling and completing your bucket list. Notice it's about you. So that educational system, it's not of God. It's against God. If you notice, it takes you away from God and focus on you. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of flesh. God is judging it. The legal system is also against God. If you look at the legal system, it's an adversarial, adversarial, adversary system. Because what it does, it puts you against another put another against you when you go through that system at the end of the day it creates animosity between parents and children friends families name it it is not of god look at all the systems that is there commerce commerce and trade as we call it it is not against it is not of god it's against god if you notice it's about profit it is not about sharing. It's about profit. So even during the pandemic, we hear of the companies that have been advancing, that have been all excelling because more people, because of what is happening with the pandemic, more people are shopping online, people are buying this, people are doing this, because many people with the, with the state of what's going on, there's a lot of panic shopping, shopping that is going on and all of that stuff. It's not about people sharing. And where the kingdom of God is concerned, it's about sharing. The system of commerce, it's not about sharing. It's about profit. Because the shareholders have to make a greater dividend at the end of the day. So all the systems, as God judged Egypt back in the days, and everything about Egypt came on the judgment, God is judging the systems of the world. Why? Let me tell you why. Because the human outside of God, this is what they put their trust in. When you think about what we shall eat, what we shall wear, what we shall drink, all of those systems are in place to support those lost. And the scripture says, whoever... Whoever give themselves over to that love, they are not of God and the love of the Father is not in them. And the scripture said, it is coming to an end. Say, whoever does the will of God will abide forever. So why God is judging it? The human has come to put their trust in it. And God wants them to see that it is, watch it, it is bankrupt. It is not what the enemy has told them that it is. Because anything that is under Satan's, anything that is under Satan's control, it is deceptive. And in the hope, God is not shaking the system and doing what he's doing for people to perish. In the hope that they will turn to him. We know that many will not. That's what it says in Revelation. That even when certain things is happening on the earth, the Bible said they would not turn away from their drugs and they will not turn away from certain things that they have been doing because these are people who do not want God. They do not want the truth. Try as you may. Think what you may. They are people. They are human that doesn't want anything to do with God. It is not just because Satan is working behind the scene. Listen to me. In order for Satan to even accomplish what he wants to accomplish with the human, the human has to agree with him. They have to agree with him. So God is judging these systems. That the world has placed its trust in. Because of what the enemy has done through that system. Systems. 
through those systems in presenting it to the human. God is judging it. God is also judging the church. And what is he doing in judging the church? To separate the church from anything that is not of him. Notice, he's shaking everything that can be shaken so that that which can be shaken will be shaken so that that which cannot be shaken will remain. So God will never come for this church. The church that we see today, God cannot receive it. God cannot come for it. So he's going to judge it. And as a matter of fact, the judgment has already started to separate the church from everything that the church has given itself over to that is not of him. And so when everything that is not of him is taken out, then he can receive the church. Then he can receive the church. Are you a part of the church? Use the word to judge what you see going on and separate yourself from what is not of God. So he says, Timothy, the perilous time that is coming in the last days, the perilous time that is coming in the last days, this is a part of what it looks like. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud. Watch this, blasphemers disobedient to parents if ever a time on the face of the earth children are disobedient to their parents is now the level of disrespect that you see you see it it, it is so much a part of our society that it is portrayed in our movies in our television shows it's all over the place and it becomes the norm when growing up in Jamaica, you could not speak to an elderly person any and any way. And I'm talking about someone that is not a part of your immediate family. You had to, you, Mr. And, and, and Miss, you, 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 couldn't, you could not call a person by their first name. John? <laughs> Joe? No, Mr. Joe. Mr. John. Miss so-and-so. Today, and I come in even into this country and we begin to see it on television, in shows, and it starts to spill out somehow even in Jamaica and other parts because America influenced Jamaica heavily. And we begin to see it in show where the children would call their parents by their first name. They would talk to them a certain way. Go into their room and slam the door. In my country where we come from, you go in a room and slam the door. As a matter of fact, in many cases, the door, the room, the room never have an door. <laughs> The room didn't have on any door in the first place. You had a curtain that was run across. And even if it had a door, you slam it, they would pull off the door. And we see all these things happening. And as I said, it becomes a norm where people say, oh, I don't see anything wrong with that. It's okay. The scripture spoke about it, that those days would come where, where disobedience to parent, disobedient to parents, unthankful. Can you tell me that we are not in that time where we have a generation that have more than any other generation has ever had on the face of the earth? We have access to so many things that any other generation has, has, has ever had on the face of the earth before. And yet, we are not satisfied. We're unthankful. Hmm? He says, unholy. What these times would look like? Unloving. Un, watch this. Unforgiving. Unforgiving. I have watched over the years in the church, and I'm not talking about the world because we have seen it in the world. And even in some cases, we have seen persons in the world that was more ready to forgive than people who are in the church. We have seen documentaries and news coming out of the world where persons, uh, where, 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 where family was willing to forgive the person who murdered their mother murdered their family member. They go into prison even before they were executed or whatever. Some of them, they're not, they're not executed. They're in death row. And they go to tell the person that I forgive you. And they don't know God. And I've seen in the church where many do not have the capacity to forgive. 
Even when you sit down and go through conversation with them and they say, oh, I forgive you. And, and they hug you and I love you. And yet, you leave and you go on. And, and weeks and months later on, you see certain things. They begin to talk about the same thing. And their behavior towards you change again. They had not forgiven you in the first place. They don't know how to forgive because it's not within them to forgive. They are a part of the spirits of the age. And this is what it says would happen. So this is the state of the world around us presently right now. Unforgiving. Watch this. Slanderers. Without self-control. Brutal. Despisers of what is good. Traitors. Headstrong, haughty, lovers of pledge. Are you, are you getting this, that this is about the end of the age? Notice the last days, perilous times. And he's giving him a list of some of the things that you need to look for as the signs of it. So that you know that you're in it. And how are you supposed to continue to conduct yourself? He said, traitors, headstrong, Haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Are we in those times? Yes. Verse 5, having a form of godliness. The church, the present church today, from the pulpit to the pew, from the pew to the pulpit, is filled with these kinds of people. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, denying its power. Watch this. The command is, and from such people, turn away. Because what happened? What, what will happen here? What will happen if we don't get this and believe this? If you remain in fellowship with these kinds of people, they're going to influence you. So as to protect yourself, the scripture says, turn away from these kinds of people. We have now accepted the world's way of thinking and dealing with things that we need to tolerate them. You know, we need to show some form of solidarity. But that's not what God says. And if we're of God, we must obey God. He says, having a form of godliness. So it means that these are people that are around what we call church. They have a form of godliness but deny its power to bring the transformation that it's meant to bring to them. Because you see, when you come into godliness, when you open yourself and submit yourself to who God is and the things that God has put in place, it transforms you to be like God. Notice, they deny. They have the form of it, but they deny the power of it. And from such people turn away. Verse 6. For of, watch this. For of this sort of people are those who crept Watch this, crept into households, into family, and made captive of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. You see why we need to hear the truth and believe it and give us a, because these are things that the enemy is doing to pull us away from God. My God, these sorts of people, why we can't have fellowship. He said they crept into family and they make captive of gullible women loaded down with sins and led them away with various loss. Verse 7, he says, always, these are people who are always learning, going from ministry to ministry, place to place. Always learning and never having the ability to come to the knowledge of what is truth. Are we hearing the spirit tonight? Are we hearing the spirit this evening? Or whatever time you're watching this? Are we hearing God? Are we in, a, are we in agreement with God? Are we on the side of God? These are things that we must take serious. Always learning. Going from conference to conference. Convention to convention. Meetings after meetings, place after place, leaving one ministry to the other, leaving one place to the other, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And it's only the truth will make you free. It says in verse 8, 
Paul now give an example and notice Paul call name. So why are you offended when I call name sometime? He says, now as Janese and Jambres resisted Moses. He says, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupts, corrupt minds disapprove of God concerning the faith. Verse 9, but they will progress, watch this, no further. So I am telling you this again, I, I prophesy this. The, the state of the present church, God have allowed it to run its course and God is judging it now. It will progress no further for their folly will be manifested to all. You notice for years the Catholic Church have covered up the corruption that has been going on. Now it is progressing no further. It is coming out and the world right now is seeing the Catholic Church in a different light. Many people have walked away from it and many people are seeing it differently because when they see the thing that have come up, because they have tried to cover it, but God says the time come that it must come to the light. It will progress no further for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. So not only the Catholic Church, the Anglican, the Methodist, the Presbyterian, the name it, the faith movement, all God is exposing it all because it's not according to his standard. And these are things in the last days. Are you getting it? These are perilous times. Perilous times. You know, I, I thought that during the time of the pandemic and the lockdowns and stuff like that, that even violence and crime would decrease. But it was the opposite. Domestic violence went up because we had the lockdown now and people that was escaping their, 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 their stagnant, sour, I'm using the words that you have been using, relationship, complicated relationship you know you notice a lot of the facebook status you know and ever so often they up, up, update their facebook, facebook status and and facebook you know you have to fill in your relationship and so you see a lot of people complicated they have these complicated relationships going on for years i'm talking about wife and husband and what was their escape is going out to work so every day they look forward to dress up and go to the office and hide from what was happening at home. Now, the order was sent out, stay home. So now you're staying home with someone that you don't love. Someone that doesn't love you and appreciate you. So for some, it changed for the better. For some, it changed for the worse. So a lot of... The, I saw on the news where they were talking to a divorce lawyer. And the lady said for the first time in the history of her business, she, I think she was practicing for over 20 odd years, she has never gotten so much case like she did throughout 2020 concerning divorce. As I said, the pandemic is not what caused the divorce. The pandemic exposed what was already there. <laughs> and we were covering it up and didn't want to face it and deal with it. And now that you have to stay home, no movements unless it's essential. <laughs> so a lot of divorce and a lot of the houses that were homes that were being sold is because of divorce. They were sold to divide the assets. It's not just because someone was looking for somewhere new to go. It was that they had to sell, divide the assets. So that was a part of it. And still a part of it. Wow. The church needs to see things like God sees it. And that's how we will be at rest. Because see, the scripture tells us this. Let me see. Do I have any more time here? The scripture tells us this, that God invites us into his rest. If we're going to come into God's rest, we have to see things as God sees it. We have to hear things as God hears it. We have to deal with things the way God deals with it. If we fail to do so, 
we can never enter into God's rest. And the scripture still saying to the people of God today, there remains a rest. There remains a rest. There remains a rest. But how many of us are willing to enter that rest? And when we hear the word, the word which is sharper than any two-edged sword, it's quick, it's alive, it's powerful. That's what brings us into that rest when we agree with God. It says in verse 10, it said, but you, Paul said now, but you, Timothy, carefully followed my doctrine, my teachings. We, we are the leaders in the church that is supposed to speak to God's people like this. That you have seen the example in front of you. Where are they? He said, but you, Timothy, have care, watch this, carefully followed my doctrine. Because this is the order of God. That those whom he set over you, you must look at them and not only hear what they say, but do what they do. He said, you have carefully followed my doctrine. Watch this, my manner of life. You have carefully followed my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my love, and my perseverance. You, you, Timothy, have seen how I have persevered through the persecution and the things that have come up against me. And then he says in verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystria. You hear him calling me here, and I can say which happened to me in Jamaica, which happened to me in the British Virgin Islands, which happened to me in Canada. Oh boy. And as Paul said, what persecution I endure. But watch this. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Hallelujah. And I can, I can say that for myself. I don't have to read that. I too can say that. And I, can, I hope I can say it to those who are following me, those who are watching Christ in me, that it encourages you that when you are facing your personal persecution, you will not crumble. You will face it with strength because you have, you have not only heard it from the word, you have not only read it, but you have seen an example in front of you. And know that the same God that have graced that person to go through that, he is my God also. He said in verse 12, he said, and watch this, and he said, yes, Timothy. He says, God has delivered me out of them all. And he says, yes, and all who desire to live godly. Are you hearing this? I have watched many walk away from God because of persecution. Many said to me, oh, when I, when I used to go to other ministry, nothing like this has ever happened. And since I started to come to Kem, Kem, the people calling my name, my name is being called up in, in whatever, whatever. Because where you were before, the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom was not preached the way that I have been preaching it. And I could also say that where you were before, maybe there was a lot of compromising when it comes to the word of God. I am not compromising the word. And therefore, when the word is taught rightly, the enemy will show up to persecute you. Why? Because he wants you to reject what you're hearing. He says, yes, and all, and I'm telling you right now, all who desire to live godly, not maybe, in Christ, not maybe, will, will suffer persecution. But don't forget the end part of verse 11. God will deliver you out of them all if you remain in the faith. And expect persecution. Do not live naively. Know that you will be persecuted if you're seeking God. If you're seeking the kingdom. The, the scripture tells us, Jesus said, that everyone who hears the word of the kingdom and receive it, he said, Satan is going to come. Persecution is going to arise because of the word. Don't let that turn you away. You press into God. And then it says, in verse 13, but evil men and impostors will grow worst and worst, deceiving and being deceived. They deceive others and then they themselves will also be deceived. He says in verse 14, but you, Timothy, must continue in the things which you have learned and 
been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Verse 15, and that from childhood you have known the scriptures. The scriptures have lost the value that it ought to have to the present church today. As I said on Sunday, even preachers talking about the Bible, they hate the word of God. And I'm saying the reason why I'm saying that is that if they love God's word, you, they would have given themselves to live according to it. But they preach one thing and go off and do another thing. They hate God's word. He said, Timothy, that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. And watch this. The Scriptures which have the ability to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in which is in Christ Jesus. And then verse 16 he says this because of what he said in verse 15. Because of what he says in verse 15 about him knowing the Scriptures from childhood. The Holy Scriptures. Notice what he says now in verse 16. And it goes for us today. All Scriptures is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for teachings, for reproof, for correction, correction of wrong thinking, wrong living, wrong behavior. It says for instruction. So instructions and directives is going to come to us from the scriptures. And notice, in righteousness and notice what it is now going to accomplish and produce when we give ourselves to it verse 17 says that 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 the man of god and now this is not talking about an individual but it's talking about the corporate man the corporate body of christ which includes all of us he said that the man of god may what may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work that God wants to put on display through them. Now you see the ultimate purpose of the scriptures. So we should not take it lightly. And that's why Paul said to Timothy in the first letter, he said, pay careful attention to the reading of the scriptures and pay careful attention to the exhortation, the teachings, the admonition that is coming to you from the scriptures. Because it's important for you to do so because it is your very life. He says, when you understand all of this and give yourself to it, it allows us to come into completion, being fully equipped for every good work that God wants to accomplish in and through us, allowing us to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. I'm going to stop here for now and I'm looking forward to continue giving myself to the Holy Spirit in these days to equip the saints of the living God with nothing else but the truth. Not dodging scriptures, twisting scriptures, giving your opinions and your feelings but what God says. And what God has said, what God had, what God had said about, about times like these. He spoke about it. Yes. So when we look at what's happening now, we cannot, as I said, allow social media or any of the medias out there to allow us to judge it. We will never judge it accurately if we're depending on that. We cannot allow them to inform us. We must now go back to the Word of God. And I think on Sunday, I was saying something also, and I, and I, 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 I think I didn't complete it. When I was making mention about Daniel being in captivity, and he knew what was prophesied by Jeremiah concerning the 70 years that they would be in captivity. And the Bible says, as the time was fulfilling, Daniel, in chapter 9 and 10, went before the Lord, and it was during that time he spent 21 days in a position where he never ate any pleasant food, he said. He didn't, you know, certain things that he would do on a normal basis. That did not happen because he said he set himself to hear from God how it would all play out. 
because he was aware of the prophecies concerning them being in captivity. That they being in captivity was not that Nebuchadnezzar just took it upon himself and decided to come against them. It was according to the word of the Lord that was spoken. So pandemic upon the earth now. Is it just random or is it fulfilling something that God spoke about concerning? So we need to go to the word, not go to social media and see what has God said about times like these and how I... Because if I am going to, as I said, rest, how am I going to rest if I don't know the truth concerning what God has said and how God is, what God is doing and how, watch this, what part do I play in it in the purposes of God? Huh? We need to go back to the word. And for those of you who didn't have a appetite for it, repent. And if you're not born again, you need to be born again. These are not the times for us to pretend. You notice the scripture told us about the pretenders and those who have been covering themselves. He said they will progress no further. God himself is seeing to it that your folly come to light. Because when you pretend in front of man, you can fool some people because not all of us you can fool. You see a lot of people, even you in Canada here and all over from Jamaica and other places, they have it to say that I am not seeing. Oh, Pastor Nancy, I am always giving people, one, the benefit of the doubt. Number two, I believe that every single person can be changed. So I am giving you time and space and room that eventually if you are willing to open yourself up to the truth of God's word, you can change. So you're not fooling everybody. There are those of us that see through you because God gives us the eyes of discernment. And if you refuse to repent, God says your folly will progress no further. It will be made manifest to all. And the all that you have been deceiving, they're going to see who you really are. These are those days. Even the pandemic. Shaking the very church. Judging the very church. Are you understanding what's going on here? Are we awake? Ephesians chapter 5. It says, awake. You who sleep, arise and Christ will give you light. The time is now. We have no option. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to continue to give a voice to your word and to the spirit speaking to the church. And I know that I'm not the only one that you're speaking through. I thank you, Lord, for those whom you have set aside, like as Elijah said to you that he was the only one left. And he said, no, I have 7,000 prophets that have not bowed their knees to Baal and they have not kissed the hands of Baal or the prophets of Baal. They are somewhere out there. You may not know where they are, but they are out there. And Father, I thank you that you have your people that you have prepared even for times like these to continue to feed the church with truth with integrity, without compromising, without hypocrisy, and allow your people, Father, to be able to properly discern the signs of the times and that we understand what is the mind of God concerning all of what we're seeing and what we're hearing and what we're experiencing. Because in the midst of the lockdown and the social distancing and the mask wearing, we are also a part of it. But as the, at the end of the day, how should we conduct ourselves in the midst of it all? The fear that is on the world should never touch us. The panic and all the things that we see going on and hearing going on around us, it should not touch us as your people. Because Father, you are not making up things as we go along. You spoke about these things way, 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 way ahead of time so as to prepare us how we ought to see the world around us. That when certain things happen, when certain things manifest, we are not shocked. We are not overwhelmed. 
We are simply giving you thanks for your faithfulness, that you're a God of truth, you cannot lie, and that what you have said, you will bring it to pass. And it allows us, Father, to even go deeper and higher in you and trusting you more, relying on you more. So, Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that as your word come forth, your people will hear. He was an ears to hear. We will hear. Thank you for the continued ministry of the word and the spirit that even when the streaming stop, the Holy Spirit will have room to continue to speak to your people and bringing them into further understanding. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the purpose of the church being in the earth, even in these times. And I thank you, Lord, for what the end of the time is meant to accomplish where your purposes are concerned. May the church come into that understanding and that truth. And may we live from that position. See Seeing things the way you see it, hearing things the way you hear it, and acting the way that you act. Because we ought to be godly in these times and continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Father, thank you for your, the purpose of your people, their journey and their destiny in you. And may they continue, Father, to press into who you are. You who are able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before your throne in glory. You are the only wise God. Dominion and power and glory belong to you both now and forever and father we continue to glorify you as the church in the earth the body of christ the body of your son giving accurate representation of who you are so father thank you again for hearing and for doing that which we have asked of you according to your word your standard according to your son the position that you have placed in him we believe that and we'll continue to believe so as we continue to go with you as you lead us into what you have already concluded with yourself from before the foundation of the world. Let it be. Let it be as it's already done in heaven. So, Father, thank you for hearing and thank you for granting it. We receive it and we tell you thanks. In Christ's name, amen. Bless you. Love you. And I commend you to God throughout the rest of the week to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to continue to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Grace and peace. Don't take this lightly. Get to understand what grace really means, what it looks like, and how it is meant to support us as the people of God, and what peace is. What peace is. And it's a grace and peace be multiplied unto us, unto you, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So until the Lord Jesus Christ return, I pray this, that may God preserve body, soul, and spirit until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So until um, uh, Sunday, I think, yeah, Sunday, God's willing, until then, continue to give yourself to the spirit and to the word so that you continue to experience the peace and the rest and what God wants to do through our individual lives and our corporate lives in time on the earth. Because God is not finished. He's working to the very end. And what he's working doesn't mean that he's something he's making, making up on, on the spot as we go along. It's something that he has already done, but time is hosting it as it manifests. So to the very end, the plans and purposes of God will continue to be at the top, dictating how everything unfolds. So I, again, I bless you, I love you, and God's willing, I will see you on Sunday as we continue to give ourselves to the unpacking of the word of God. So we walk by faith and not by sight, continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Bye-bye, hug, squeeze, and I'll see you soon.